let's look at the handout now. Uh, this handout that I gave you has uh, several concepts, things that we're going to apply, but let's jump first actually to page two. So on page two of your document, go ahead and let's look at what we've got here. Sorry, real quick. I think somebody grabbed my printing. It has my information on it. Can somebody look and see if you grab my print? Well, um, it has, it, I type on it in bold. The last. So this, these conversion goals, these are on page two. Let's take a look at page two, uh, where it says, you must decide the goals of your company early on. In my fictional business, Victor's Bakery, I want, to, I want people to buy my cupcakes. That's a conversion goal. In order to get to that goal, I have many goals before that point. So basically, a conversion is there is a potential client, for example, and they have not been converted yet. They were a non-client, and they were converted to a client. But that's a big, uh, that's a big step from a non-buyer to a buyer because I'm going to have a lot of little goals in between this part, a lot of smaller conversion goals before getting to the final one. So let's look at some possible examples here. Get followers on Twitter. So okay, I'm ultimately trying to sell cupcakes, but I'm going to also get followers on Twitter. I'm going to get on Twitter. Twitter is free to create and to use, of course. And then I'm going to try to get more followers on Twitter. Uh, having more followers on Twitter is, on the one hand, a good ego boost, because I have a higher number. I feel good about myself. But on the other hand, Twitter is also very good for having a captive audience. So I'm going to have, let's say, 50 followers on Twitter. I'm going to tweet something, and I could potentially have 50 people that saw my message. I could say, sale this Saturday on cupcakes. Use this coupon. I could tweet that. So let's say I have 50 followers. Unfortunately, we, we cannot assume that all 50 of those followers will see it, number one, and actually act upon it, number two. Let's say we go by the rule or the, the theory of 1%. 1% of my social media followers are going to be the ones that really convert, that really follow through. 50%, I mean 1% of 50 people is how many? Half a person? Round it up. One person. So one person out of 50 is actually going to go through and buy my cupcake. Well, you might think that's a very, very low percentage. But out of that tweet, which was free, I just t tweeted a picture of my cupcake and a link, and one person bought it. That's amazing. I made a sale. Obviously, if I have 100 people, if I have 500 followers, if I have a thousand followers, still think about it in terms of 1% and how many you're reaching. So one possible conversion goal along the way of making a sale is get followers on Twitter because I might have more of a, of a captive audience. Another goal, get social interactions on Facebook. And I'm sure there's different words for it, but here I've got likes, shares, comments. These are the social interactions. These are the possible things that someone can do on Facebook. You've used Facebook. You've probably heard of Facebook. So these are the things that someone can do to your content on Facebook. Question. So what about geographically? Like, okay, your bakery's in Chula Vista, and you're going to Twitter out to, you know, 300 people, and some of them are in New Jersey. I mean, can you, like, regulate geographically the printer is off at the moment, so that's not going to come out because it's noisy during the lecture. Or is that a, a smart thing to do? That the thing about that, uh, which is always a concern, if I'm a local company, yes, I might be reaching a national audience or even an international audience. We will be able to actually target your tweets or your Facebook posts per geographic location. 
So you could focus on the San Diego audience. You might have 500 followers and maybe 200 are in other states, but we can target our social media posts usually to a location. So let's say on Facebook, um, I also want to build an audience on Facebook. I also want to build social interactions. I want to get likes, I want to get shares, I want to get comments. For example, if I post something on Facebook uh, and I share that, um, someone else could see it and they could also share it. They could also be a cheerleader for me. They could be a marketer for me. They could um, take my post and send it to their friends. That's a share. And then that could be sent over to their friends, friends of friends. So that's why I also want to be active on different social media, because I could have my followers and such further uh, spreading my message. And I do want to mention this. I mentioned it earlier, but for the people that came in late, no food and beverages in the classroom, please. Uh, your coffee and so forth. You don't want it near, you the, near your computers. I've got some space right here on the side. Please take a moment to put your food and beverages off to the side there, please. You have a beverage back there, please. Uh, as I said, food and beverages out of the way of the computers, please. So furthermore, with uh, social media, Google+. Plus. How many of you have heard of Google+, Plus before this class? Okay, very good. If you haven't, Google+, Plus is another social network where I can potentially reach an audience. Because if I'm only on one social network, I might reach an audience. But if I'm on more social networks, I can reach more of an audience. So let's say I'm also on Google+. Plus. And traditionally, Google+, Plus has been very integrated with Google Search. So if someone is searching on Google search, I might get my Google Plus stuff to appear on, on a Google search. So let's say I want people to also visit me on Google Plus because that's where I can create a, a Google local profile. Have you ever searched for, let's say, a restaurant? And you get a Google search full of results, but some results have a star rating and reviews and such, and some others don't. Well, if you've set up a Google Plus profile, that's how you can get featured like that. That's how you can get that star rating or be on that map or have those uh, testimonials. Question? It is actually. That whole Google Plus, Google Local integration, it's, it's free, so we might as well take advantage of it. So that's another goal there. Get on Google Plus because I can then possibly be featured on, on that sort of search. More visibility then could lead to more sales of my cupcakes. Question? Is there a way to handle um, bad reviews? Like if you start getting like three star reviews, it's just like, okay, we're not going to do reviews. We're just going to put the plus. Yes, uh, really, it's about the interaction. Um, you don't want to be just a faceless company that's on social media you want to reply. Google gives you the ability to reply to comments, positive or negative. So if you reply to positive comments, that creates more goodwill between your possible customers. They could give you more word of mouth and so forth. Negative comments, same sort of thing. You want to reply to them and that's an art and a science to replying to negative comments. You want to be positive. You want to say, well, how can we make it better? You don't want to offer, someone asked this in the other class, but uh, people say, well, uh, uh, you're just, you're just going to beg for good reviews? That sounds like a scam. No, you're not going to beg. You're not going to bribe for good reviews. You're going to say, we, uh, we, we did something wrong. Please come to our restaurant again. We'll, we'll try to do better. You're not going to say, come back to the restaurant and get a free meal for four stars. You're not going to be that obvious because that's not going to help you in the long term. But you are going to reply in positive ways to try to get people to hopefully change their bad review into a good review. What's funny, uh, I got a notification the other day from one of the clients that I run, um, that one Mexican food restaurant. Someone wrote uh, a five-star review. So I got the email that says, someone wrote a brand new five-star review on your profile. So I read it, and unfortunately the person had mistaken my client for the... Chinese food restaurant next door. 
So they gave a really nice review about finding the best wontons in the city to my client who sells Mexican food. So I replied and I said, thank you for this great review. Unfortunately, you might have confused us with another great restaurant. We'd love for you to come to our restaurant one day and give us such a fine review. So they may or may not do so. They may or may not notice that. Um, that was good that we got a five-star review, although it wasn't for the restaurant. So I still took the time to, to reply to them. Yeah. I believe so. I think they make it pretty public. Um, Google Plus, I believe on Yelp, uh, you can do that privately. But usually you do want to be public. If someone put a negative review, you want to counteract it publicly with a positive attempt to make it good. So you, you would want it to be public. Um, and I believe on Google Plus it's automatically public. On Yelp, you can make it private if you want. Another conversion goal that I might have in the course of trying to sell cupcakes is get more hits on my homepage, get more traffic to my homepage. I might have this really well designed website that I spent $5,000 on to set up and be able to sell cupcakes and all of that on my site. But uh, if a tree falls in the wood and no one's around to tweet about it, did it really happen? So if no one visits my website, but I've got a great website, is it being effective? So I want to get more traffic to my website. And that's the million dollar question. That's the whole point of being in this course. Hopefully you're seeing it's not just a one answer how to get traffic to your website. It's all of these pieces together. On Twitter, I could be saying, I could tweet something to my followers and say, um, get this exclusive coupon you, and, and there's a link and that link goes to my website or it could go to a landing page I'll talk about landing pages in more detail later but I could have a a tweet with a landing page link I could have a post on Facebook with something to entice people to come to my website because at my website is where I'm gonna sell my products as I said I can't sell my cupcakes on Twitter yet or on Facebook or on Google Plus. I have to do it on my website or at my store on Main Street. So I'm just trying to get the more traffic I get, again, the 1% rule, I might get a thousand hits to my website this month, this year, let's say. Um, what's 1% of a thousand? 10? So 10 sales. That's really good. Out of a thousand hits, you might think the percentage is very low. But that's still tangible results from people visiting my website. Buying my product, booking my band for the next gig, donating to my nonprofit, uh, reading my short stories, whatever you're trying to do online. You want more traffic because the more you have, the 1% rule then will show you that you've gotten these sales. Get more shares on my blog posts from my site. So. One thing that we'll be talking about in this class, and I have another class where we get into it in detail, is that blogging is important. Blogging is basically putting out content to the internet on a regular basis. You can blog once a month, once a week, once a day, whatever. You can put out content, a brand new blog post, once a month, let's say. As a beginner, it's a very good goal to blog once a month, 100 words once a month. It's better to blog, let's say, 500 words once a month. It's even better 200 words once a day. In short, every, in short, the more you do it, the better, because you're putting content of your website, of your online presence, out to the world, out to the web. So when someone does a search on Google or Bing or whatever, your content may appear, may have more probability of appearing. Because if you've only got your website and you don't change it at all, what's to entice the search engines to feature your content above your competitor? What's to entice the search engines is that you're blogging more, more consistently than your competitor. You've got another blog post about the recipe of the month. You've got another blog post about the testimonials that your nonprofit has gathered about the lives you've changed. Yes? You know, what I noticed is I'm always following my competitors' blogs and stuff like that. It just seems like nobody's really getting it on their tweets and their Facebook posts. 
They just put drivel out there that's like, why am I even looking at this? You know, I'm never going to share this because it's just, you just told me you got this in stock. Wow. <laughs> you know, like, who cares? I'm not going to post that. On my, I'm not going to like that. And I, I think most people don't get it. you got to think about these posts you're putting on there. You know, with the whole goal of being, I want people to share this. And you exactly. put crap out the post for just posting safe. You're just wasting everybody's time. That's a good side of the other side of the coin. I have here, okay, I want to get more shares to my blog post. I want to put out blog posts, yes, but I do want to think about what I'm putting out so that I can entice people to share it. You've probably seen plenty of articles out there that say the top five ways to save money, the top ten travel destinations, how to cook a turkey. You've seen all of these great posts out there that probably you've shared. So think about that in that terms as well. If you take the blogging class, we go into more detail about crafting content that is shareable. So at the very minimum, okay, they're posting something and it's not the best, but that still gives you some cachet to possibly be found. So even though it's not the best content, they're putting their name out there compared to the competitors that is not doing it. What's better is that they are posting the top five Spider-Man comics this month. You know, there's like 20 this month, isn't there? So uh, that's a better thing, posting out content that people want to share. At the minimum, posting content on a regular basis. Better, posting content that people care to share. Yes? Um, I understand the value in the content, but um, this is probably a question for the blogging class, but as we're on the topic, what about the comments? Um, when I go online as well, and I'm looking at people's blogs, so I get sort of caught up in the numerous, numerous comments after a blog entry, which often include a lot of spam or uh, questions that seem like you were just suggesting of Yelp, you probably should respond to. So then the person who wrote the original blog post must now go back and write in to all the questions, as well as some people just openly leave their own website. Mm -hmm. That's their comment. So um, blog-wise, would you say that there's still a value in just blogging but deactivating comments if you don't want to deal with all of that? You, you, there's a middle ground. There's leave your comments open for anyone to post. There's turn off comments so no one can post. And the middle ground is moderate your comments. If you use a platform like WordPress, you can turn on an option that says moderate post, uh, moderate comments. So nothing will show up until you approve it. Now, also something like WordPress is very good at weeding out the spam. So if someone simply posts their web address and nothing meaningful, most likely the algorithm will automatically not display it. And then so all the other comments that the algorithm is not smart enough to, to weed out, you're going to get an email that says a new comment has been added to your post. And directly from your email, you can click Approve, Deny, Spam. So I would recommend uh, have comments, but have a moderation system in place to weed out the negative comments. And it is more work, something yet, a, yet another thing to, take, to pay attention to, that maybe people are asking questions, you do want to reply. But actually, this whole concept of comments in blog posts now, it really is at a transition phase. There are many big websites out there that are just turning off their comments and moving the conversation over to social media. We don't know at the moment if that's going to pay off, but we're definitely in, at a transition. Not every website now allows comments. They say, follow the conversation on Twitter, where there you have kind of maybe less of, of a... Uh, of an incentive to really answer. Uh, it's not cluttering your own website. It's cluttering up Twitter, but it's not cluttering up your website. In the search engine, see there's activity related to your website on Facebook, but it's not cluttering up your website. So things are changing. I would say at the least, turn on comment moderation. Don't let any crazy person write any crazy thing until you approve it. I find that on the blocking of the comments, if it's controlled, if it's, you know, if there's no spam and there with moderating or just keeping the conversation civil and pertinent. It's very interesting stuff. Yeah. And that's that's the stuff I would look at. In fact, it's me. I would mean, never take care of it unless it's like 60 characters or whatever it is. It's like, you know, a lot, I was telling you earlier, a lot of, like in my business, a lot of the creators and stuff, they get off of it. Mm -hmm. They're not paying attention to Twitter anymore because they can't respond properly. Mm -hmm. It's a different context. There's a lot of problems happening. 
that is one of the many signals that the search engines look at. Uh, that's the fancy term, just to say, what are the variables that the search engines are looking at? How often have you updated your site? And all the things we'll be talking about in this class. One of the signals is that about, um, do you have a lot of spam uh, on your comments? Do you even have comments? The unfortunate part is we don't know legitimately and accurately what the signals are that the search engines have because those are trade secrets. Google and Bing, the two big search engines that we're going to talk about, they're in competition with each other. Each of them feels they can give you the best search results with their own proprietary code, their own algorithm, their own computer software. Therefore, they're not going to publish all the secrets. Google is not going to publish every single secret that says, make sure you do this on your website because Bing would copy it. Bing is not going to copy everything about their algorithm that they claim will, is better because then Google will copy it, because then Yahoo will copy it, because then AltaVista will copy it. So there's a lot of these signals, a lot of the algorithm that is hidden, trade secrets. But we will be able to, in general terms, know what is good and what is bad SEO. So I can't exactly say. Is it good right now to turn off comments? Um, uh, it's still at, at a transition. We don't quite know. But I would at least hedge my bets and have comments, but turn on moderation. And if you have good moderators, keeping the conversation civil, putting good content, that I don't doubt is helpful for your SEO. The opposite would also be true. What's bad for your SEO is have comments just full of um, cheapcanadianmeds.com links. And that you can avoid with um, comment moderation, auto, either automatic spam detection or manual spam detection. But the point is I want to have content on my blog, on my website that, that I share because then now suddenly your name is being put out there more online for the search engines to find. I'm not saying you need to do all of these. These are many ideas to have to reach your ultimate conversion goal, which we're not there yet. Another possible conversion goal is get subscribers to my coupon newsletter. So newsletters. You've probably visited websites that have on the side that say subscribe to the newsletter. And you probably ignored it. But if you saw something instead that says add your email to get our free ebook on how to do SEO, you've probably done that. That's the same thing. They've enticed you to get into their newsletter and obviously to take it to the cynical level they've got your email so they can market to you but marketing doesn't have to be a dirty word marketing is advertising marketing is getting the name of your website out to people and there's of course the spammy marketing and the more positive marketing but in short if you have an email database you could be judiciously sending out emails to people once a month, let's say, so that it's not overwhelming, about the latest things about your website. This is on sale. Next month we're going to do this out community outreach. Follow us on Twitter. So you've got a newsletter. Let's say in this particular case I've got a coupon newsletter. I'm enticing people on my home page. Follow our newsletter or subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive coupons and keep them exclusive. Don't tweet those coupons out on Twitter or put them on Facebook. Keep them in that newsletter to entice people. Maybe I should get on that newsletter. Question. Are newsletters really pertinent anymore? Because the way I'm thinking of it, I'm thinking if you've got a, a nice blog, you put good quality content on it, you, you update it regularly. Maybe you go on once a day. Maybe you go on several times a week. It's like, because, I mean, my routine, I get up in the morning and I, I, I follow certain blogs, you know, related to my industry. And, you know, and I, and I read these things religiously and, it, and I care less about the newsletters. They're not, I don't, sometimes they're sending me newsletters, but there's usually nothing in it. It's more they're directing me back to the blog. And I just think newsletters are kind of passe that, that a well-maintained blog integrated into the website. Because isn't the whole point of all this is to get people to the website? Yes. To restore the digital website. Mm -hmm. And newsletters, to me, are kind of... It definitely... I'm going to put that effort in on a really maintained, uh, well-maintained, uh, pertinent blog. No, that's... Way more fun to read. That's definitely a legitimate... Concern. Let me address that. Do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I do. I just think it's just one more tool. And if you test a tweet, a blog, a newsletter, or what have you, it's whatever's giving you the best results. Yeah. I, I, yeah. You know, it depends, I guess, 
on what your blog is or what your website, what product you're selling. But there's also another responsibility. Now you gotta write a newsletter. Well, one of the others, depending on your audience and what their um, feedback is. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that cheaply as well, or maybe $5. So if you budget $5 a week, you know, that's $20 a month to spend a little bit at a time here and there on the different social networks as a business to use it for as, as a payment, as a marketing, as an advertising platform, you will see that you get results. Later on, I can show you, for example, a couple of clients that when we spent $30 for one particular post, uh, it got so much more traffic to the Facebook, and then I can show you the receipts from the owner that said, look at how much more we sold of that product that you advertised on Facebook. So you may think about it, well, that's, that's an affront to my sensibilities. Paying for a tweet? It's free. It is. But to reach more of an audience, just like in the real world. You pay uh, very little to get on the penny saver, where few people will see it. You pay a little bit more to get on that slick, glossy magazine that maybe less people will see it, but more targeted people will see it and buy your product. So there is an aspect of paying for this stuff. Uh, I'm not going to go into very much detail in this class about that, but that is a possibility. S uh, set aside a budget of $5 a month and spend it and you will see that it does give you traffic to your social media which ultimately of course the goal is get clients to buy my cupcakes so it's a big jump from I have lots of followers on Twitter to I have lots of buyers of my cupcake doing more of as many of these as you can will help you not saying do them all but doing as many if you're not doing any of these things here if you never thought of any of these things you have more to think about to do on your site or outside of your site, SEO, SEM. You should see that it's a long, involved process to get from point A, a potential client follows you on Twitter, to point Z, the follower visits the store and buys a product. That is why search engine optimization goes hand in hand with search engine marketing. Also, an emerging term that takes both into account is content marketing. You can follow that link to read that article, what is content marketing. That's just the perhaps the, the newer en vogue term that you might hear more often. You might not hear SEO as much. Perhaps you might hear content marketing more. We'll see how things go in that direction or not. But content marketing, you're putting content out on the internet so that the search engines can find you, so that you can get traffic and sales, etc. Um, any questions on any of this stuff on page two? Again, there's a lot of theory. This class isn't just like, let's get your keywords and put them in your meta tags. There's a lot of concepts of modern SEO, and it's always changing. But really, the evergreen concept is content. If you've got good content, you're ahead of your competition. Just because you've got a nice website, it's not that important. Just because you've also got, you've 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 uh, claimed a Twitter account but don't use it, that's not as important. Are you tweeting often? Are you blogging? Are you updating your website? Do you have a good-looking website? Do you have content that people are sharing, etc. Let me show you this blog post that I think is very valuable from a colleague of mine. If you go to the web, we can go to brandgfx, brandgraphics.com, brandgfx. Let's go to brandgraphics.com, brandgfx. They're a marketing company. They have this great blog post that we're going to rip off one day, but we'll look at hers first. Um, brandgraphics.com. There's a blog post. We're going to have to search for it. I think it came out a little while ago uh, about, it. I think it's called the comprehensive or maybe the exhaustive list of marketing techniques. Let me look it up. I forgot to, to look it up. But uh, over on the blog, <coughs> so there's a blog right at the top, right? GFX. GFX. Brand GFX. If you go over to the blog at the top right, I believe there's search here, so I think it's called Compre 
Let me find it, then I'll tell you. Oh yes, this, that's it, exactly. So go to the blog, and then search the keyword comprehensive. Comprehensive. The first result should be the comprehensive list of ways to market your business. So on the blog there, search comprehensive, the first result. Notice it says it was published March 10th, 2013, but then updated this year. So this is a concept you should make a note of. If you're going to blog, it's okay to, repup to repurpose your blog posts. If you wrote something a couple of years ago, probably it's out of date, especially when it deals with technology. So it's okay to edit your old blog posts, reshare them on Twitter, reshare them on Facebook. You did it a year ago, you might have new followers. Most likely you've got new followers that haven't seen this before. You might have old followers and maybe one or two will say, this again I saw it two years ago. I have a photographic memory. But other people are gonna forget and say, oh, that's, that's, a good, that's a good post again, and might share it. So she concedes here that this is always changing, so actually it should be called the almost comprehensive, always expanding, never complete list of ways to market your business. There's no order here. These are just ideas. None of them are like, do this. But these are ideas, and maybe many of these terms you don't, you don't know. Well, search it search for it on Bing search for it on Google search for it on Yahoo but just uh, taking a quick look I'm gonna jump through a few again I'm not really gonna explain them because there's always a lot of things you can do word of mouth commercials like on the web or TV infomercials editorials getting on Wikipedia engaging in SEO and SEM newsletters e-blasts direct mail sponsorships volunteering business cards I read several interesting articles recently that talk about business cards are back, just like vinyl is back. So if you've got a really cool business card, because everyone gave up business cards, just find me on LinkedIn. But if you've got a cool business card you can give people, no one else is giving a business card, that's going to make you stand out. What's old is new again. Using coupons, groupons, etc. Thank you letters, vehicle wraps. You're driving around the city probably, why not put your company on the side of your vehicle. Infographics, online surveys, short form video, Vine, Instagram, animated GIFs. Find a university or professional course in your area and offer to be a guest speaker. So teach a class on what your product is. You know, one hour, a 30 minute class I'm sure there's always places that accept guest speakers, especially for free. And then the freeness of it is offset by potentially at the end of the course, everyone rush, rushes up to you. Can I have your business card? Can I have your contact info? Yes. Yeah, so the section up here on networking goes along those lines there, and the point is, try it. Um, that particular client, the one that's the most full service that we offer, the, the Texcoco website, the Mexican food restaurant, he's an owner that says, I don't want to be a business owner that is afraid to try things. Oftentimes these things are not free, but he set a, a budget that he's going to try. I'm going to try this radio ad for this month or two, see how it goes. Okay, after two months, evaluate. Did it really work? Okay, I can decide to try harder or try something else. Get in a printed ad. 
get on the newspaper, try more Pinterest, get on this new fancy thing the kids are, are getting on, Snapchat. I've heard of it. I don't know how it works. I want to learn how it works. It might work for me. If it doesn't, there's another network coming out every few weeks. So there's a lot of ideas right here to, to think about. Obviously, the more you do, the better, but the more you do, the more time and effort and money you're putting into it all. And many things here could be free and many things could not be free. Getting in a magazine, perhaps, might not be free, especially advertising in magazines and such, print advertising. Promoted posts, that's basically paying to increase the visibility of your tweets or your Facebook posts and such. Video marketing is becoming a big one. So these are not in any order of importance because that would be a very difficult thing to do. It's always changing, but I will say, and you should make a note, that video marketing, so getting on YouTube or Vimeo or other video websites, is becoming much more important. If you never thought about it, um, the theory is that um, YouTube is actually the second largest search engine. Not Bing, not Yahoo, etc. YouTube. People go on YouTube and search how to bake a cake, how to dance, how to tie a tie, uh, how to install WordPress. So people are searching for cat videos on YouTube, of course, always, but they're going to be searching for how to build a responsive website. And they find a video, one hour long, two minutes long. So think about that. If you take my social media class, let me tell you this, if you have the time, next Wednesday, 6 p.m., is my social media class. And next week, I'm going to do my lesson on, on YouTube. So if you've heard about this thing called YouTube and you want to make your own videos and, and get on YouTube, I'm going to do the YouTube lesson next we Wednesday. Um, technically, you're not enrolled in that class, so that's all I can say about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> is that the 12.32 or just the 6? No, that's the one from 6 to 9.30 p.m. Uh, next Wednesday, 6 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. We're going to do the class on YouTube. I'm going to provide a video. Just let me finish my thought here. I'm going to provide a, uh, a video for us, and I'm going to talk about using a video editor to edit the video, to remove the silence, and to remove the mistake, and put in some music and all of that, and create a YouTube account and upload it and SEO optimize our YouTube. So that's the social media for businesses, part two. It's going to be offered again in a month or two. I don't know the times yet, but it will be offered again, but I know it's coming up next Wednesday. 6 to 9.30 p.m. Yes? The one who wants to be a YouTube channel, have you shared it with lots before? No, it's the one from 6 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Wednesday. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This Wednesday. Is sorry, sorry, I teach too many classes. <laughs> Wednesday, yes, sorry. Wednesday is the 12.30 to 4 p.m. Yes, sorry about that. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Let me just put it, pull it up on the website here. Tuesdays and Thursdays is usually when I'm here 6 p.m. to 9.30. But Mondays and Wednesdays, now that I remember, those are the days that it's 12.30 to... Exactly, yes. It's not live, so you're not going to see the video live on YouTube. Uh, for this class, you need to request the video link, and I'll send it to you. For the other class, technically, you need to be enrolled before requesting that video. But you can see me later for your full answer. The actual class, I, I pull it up right here. Um, Social Media for Your Business Part 2. It's going to be, it's Wednesday, 12.30 noon to 4 p.m. I misspoke. Uh, some of my classes are at 6 p.m., but that one's at 12.30 p.m. What's that? Oh, this one is during the day? Yeah, as, as I just said, I misspoke. Uh, I teach too many classes, and I forgot that it's actually 12.30 to 4, not uh, 6 p.m. Now, it's going to be offered again, if we take a look. Social Media Part 2 is going to be offered again in, um, uh, in, in December. 
Friday, 9.30 to 1. So if you've already blocked this time, all you have to do is wait for December, and I'm teaching it again. So my classes are always my classes are always uh, changing. Sometimes I, I, I show up and I remember, oh, I'm teaching this class. But uh, you should check here then. So getting back to our class here, various ideas for marketing. And this might be a very good post to share. So I'm happy to give Brand Graphics a little word of mouth marketing. They've got a newsletter that you can subscribe to, and you can also share it on social media and comment. Yes? Is it um, not right to take that blog and put it on your blog and say compliments of the school company? Is that not that's, the that's more of a, of a problematic thing, depending how you do it. Uh, if you copy and paste basically everything and then add an attribution, that still might not be okay. Um, various legal reasons why it might not be okay. But a particular company itself might be okay. Yeah, take my blog as long as you give attribution, as long as you give a link. Perhaps a better thing to do would be on your own Twitter or Facebook or whatever, write your your blurb about it with a link back to them. It's not such a good idea to take theirs, especially verbatim, even if you give them a link back. That You don't know if that company is going to be very litigious and say, hey look, you took our content. And I don't care that you added a link, you don't want to take my content. So it'd be safer. You can always contact them. They're on social media, they've got a contact screen. You can ask them. You may say, can I repurpose your blog on mine? They may say no. They might say yes, but do it this way, please. So it's better to ask. Any other questions on part two here? Or other concepts? Page two. Again, a lot of theory. We can't talk about everything here. The social media stuff, there's a class for that. The blogging stuff, there's a class for that. Uh, I don't, there's no really class or anything about effective newsletters and such, unfortunately, but um, what we're going to do is actually uh, take uh, one more break to uh, catch our breath, and then we're going to back up and actually do this first part here, which is to set up the webmaster tools. And usually what happens when we, when we do this part, uh, because everyone's website varies, I'm going to talk about it in general terms, and then we're going to do... Uh, individual help if necessary. But it's 11.15, let's take one more 10 minute break. Um, when we come back we'll, uh, we'll do page one here. I'm going to turn the printer back on in just a moment so you can print again and then we'll actually set up our webmaster tools.